This story of Jacob is a long saga in the book of Genesis. We left Jacob as the sun was coming up and he was limping. So let's hear what happens more from the 33rd chapter, the very next verses of this story. Listen for God to speak to you. And listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front and Leah with her children and Rachel and Joseph last of all. Jacob himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? And Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children, and they bowed down. Leah also and her children drew near and bowed down, and finally Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, What do you mean by all this company that I have met? And Jacob answered, to find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, No, please, if I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand. For truly to see your face is like seeing the face of God, since you have received me with such favor. Please accept my gift that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me because I have everything I want. So he urged him and he took it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever felt like your, your vision has changed, like what you were able to see clearly before has been altered? It happens to the best of us sometime in midlife when that dreaded presbyopia strikes. If you're not there yet, it'll come. 40s or 50s, sometimes in that period, the words in the hymnal are going to shrink. And if you sew, when you try to thread the needle, that eye of the needle is going to become non-existent. And someone is going to get up and keep moving the road signs farther away from the exit as you get close to your exit. For others with more serious complications, things may grow especially fuzzy and cloudy, dim and distorted, and you may not be able to read like you used to or even recognize faces of loved ones. With the loss of your vision, you lose things most precious to you. But did you ever have your vision go the other way? For me, reading glasses made all the difference in midlife until I grew frustrated trying to remember where I placed them of all the places I would lay them around the house. Then trifocals were amazing. And perhaps if you wore glasses as a kid, you remember the day you got the first pair of glasses when suddenly what was on the blackboard or on the screen, you could read. When Brad had his cataract surgery last year, we were both amazed that he no longer needed the glasses that had been essential for decades. Throughout the years, our vision can change for the worse or for the better. And I don't mean just our eyesight. Today, in our story about Jacob, we realize that Jacob's vision has improved so much that he can see the face of God. And of all places, Jacob sees God's face in that red and ruddy face of his twin brother, Esau. What has happened? Was it a cornea transplant or LASIK surgery? Not at all. But it was indeed a miracle, a miracle of his heart. Jacob has fought with his twin brother Esau his entire life. If you know the story, even before they were born, when their mother Rebecca was carrying them in her womb. She could feel the twins tussling and struggling, moving around, almost wrestling to see who could be born first. You know there's a lot at stake in this time and place to be the firstborn son. 
If that's you, you get the blessing, the inheritance, the grand prize, the royal treatment. Ponder in our own time the difference it is between being Prince William and Prince Harry. For the firstborn, even among twins, the family blessing is bestowed upon you. No wonder, even in the birth canal, as Esau's, Esau's head is emerging, Jacob is still scrambling to try to get ahead. He's holding on to the heel of Esau as they're being born, trying to pull him and get ahead of him, trying to slow him down and to be first. It is no surprise that when the second boy is born, he is named Jacob, which means the grabber. And we know what happens with these twins. They compete and butt heads the rest of their life. Maybe there's someone in your life that sparks that competitive flair. Might be a sibling or a colleague. Someone you just want to prove that you're a little bit better than they are. You want to be a little smarter, a little more athletic. The one who gets the better job, has the better marriage, the most successful children, the most grandchildren, whatever it is, almost unconsciously you are competing to do better. A competition is not a bad thing, but for Jacob it meant a childhood and a lifetime of deception and trickery, egged on by his mother, who in a moment of poor parenting, Rebecca hatches a scheme so that this favorite son, who is Jacob, can steal the coveted birthright from his older brother Esau. They work together and deceive their older father Isaac, who is now blind and elderly, into thinking that Esau is standing before him, and he gives the blessing instead to Jacob. Esau is enraged. Jacob anticipates his brother's anger, so he leaves town. He hides out with his uncle Laban to start a new life to create his own wealth. But what must have continued to haunt Jacob were the last words he heard from his brother Esau. The last words out of his mouth, because Esau said, Jacob, I will kill you. There's been no other contact since then. No phone calls, no visits, no cards, even on their shared birthday. And Jacob does very well. He goes off to the land of his uncle Laban. He marries Rachel, his beloved, as well as her older sister Leah. He acquires servants and the best livestock, outstanding herd of sheep and goats. And as you read this story, Jacob continues to trick and deceive even his uncle Laban out of the best of what the families can offer. In fact, today our scripture lesson begins as Jacob is once more on the run. Laban has realized Jacob has tricked him out of the best herds and flocks that he has. Rachel has stolen the household gods and they're running away. You see, Jacob has viewed and seen everyone, even his brother and his uncle and his family as mere objects, as barriers to his own personal success and ambition. It hasn't mattered to him that he's deceived his brother. He's tricked his uncle. He's fractured relationships in his family. He's lied to his father. He's broken everyone's trust and been banished from his homeland. It hasn't mattered until this night by the Jabbok River. Perhaps there comes a moment when the strategies and our ways of living suddenly don't seem to work anymore. Jacob would seem to have everything that one would dream of, and yet we find him empty with nowhere to go. His options are running out. To escape his uncle Laban's anger, he must cross the Jabbok River and enter the land of his brother Esau. And he still remembers from his youth, those last words that he had heard. Jacob, if I ever see you again, I will kill you. Fearful, exhausted, trapped, blinded by his own plans and agenda, Jacob begins to send peace offerings to Esau, trying to appease him and win his favor. 
oxen and donkeys and sheep, sheep and goats, anything to try to save his own neck. He even sends his children, his servants, his wives across the river, and now he lays down, and he's all alone. Do you ever have a strategy that just didn't work out? Jacob has been conniving and trying to fool people all his life, looking out only for himself, seeing others as simply rungs to climb over, to pass on the ladder of success, people to use and step on and step over to get ahead. And now it's not working so well. Countries can do that. We can shout, America first, and find ourselves isolated and with fractured relationships. It's not that we don't have pride in who we are, but we, we become very protective of what we have. We're afraid there's not enough to go around. Millions of people today are refugees and homeless, forced to leave their home. They're on the move because there are famines and wars and gangs that threaten their very lives. We can see those others as threats to our own security, our job opportunities, our entitlements for having gotten to this country centuries ago, forgetting that many of our brave ancestors were also immigrants, escaping potato famines and poverty, poor growing conditions for farmers and brutal dictatorships. And yet through our eyes, we see these others as simply objects and threats, things to fear, certainly not as people. In the New Testament, Jesus tells the story of a man who is blind who asks to be healed. So Jesus bends down and spits into the dust, and with that saliva, he puts on the cr crusty and useless eyes of this man. And the man blinks a few times and stares ahead, and Jesus says, can you see anything? He says, I think I see people, but they really, they look like trees walking around. So Jesus touches him a second time, and the man blinks and looks intently and says, now I see clearly. I see that there are people. What miracle needs to take place that instead of seeing others in our global family as trees, as useless barriers, as threats to our security and happiness, how can we see them not as things to eliminate or get rid of? What miracle do we need to see clearly that there are people like us? That's what happens to Jacob. And that miracle does not come easily. He struggles, he wrestles, he battles that whole night long by the Jabbok River with that assailant, that messenger, that angel, that presence of God. In that long, dark night of his soul, God wrestles with Jacob. And Jacob struggles, but wrestles until he receives a blessing and a new insight. Jacob is wounded. He's going to limp the rest of his life. He's different. He is forever changed, but I think the blessing is this new vision. He is so changed by this encounter with God that he's given a new name. No longer is he the grabber. He is named Israel, one who strives and wrestles with God. And Jacob says, in this place, I have seen God. Can you think of anyone else in the Bible whose name was changed when they encounter God? In the New Testament, Saul is the persecutor of those who follow Jesus. And Saul encounters God on that road to Damascus. The risen Christ confronts him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul becomes Paul when he realizes the risen Christ is before him. 
And you remember, after that encounter, he's blind for several days. He cannot see. And when his eyes healed and he opens them, he sees those brothers and sisters in front of him, those who believe in Christ, not as threats, not as people to be persecuted, but as family. When Jacob, now Israel, wakes up that next morning, he limps across that river. He braces to meet Esau, that brother that he hasn't spoken to. He bends down in meekness and humility, perhaps for the first time in his life. Esau says, I don't need any of your bribery. I don't need these peace offerings. Instead, Esau runs out to him, meets him, hugs him, embraces him, kisses him, maybe for the first time in their life. And Jacob, now Israel, must have rubbed his eyes in disbelief. What he sees is not his twin brother, but in Esau's forgiveness, he sees the face of God. How can our eyes be open to see each other in new ways, in ways that unite us rather than divide us into partisan factions? In this week in which we celebrate our independence, our pride as Americans, we Christians must claim a priority even higher than our national allegiance. You see, this is not an American table. This is not a Protestant Anglo table. This is the Lord's table, where brothers and sisters come not only from this country, but from the east and the west, and the north and south in this global family. This table is a place where you don't need a passport or a visa or even permission. All you need is a hunger for the living presence of God and the hope of a new vision to see as Christ sees us, not as trees walking around, not as objects, but as people. Let us pray. Open our eyes that we may see, that we may see you, Lord, in one another. Amen.